So I start with a story and a joke. Uh, Vijay just told you I am editor of some series. And the people who write books and papers are often rather sloppy. So instead of saying theorem, they may write THM. That's the way they write it in their notes. That's the way they write it on the board. But it can't go into a book like that. So many years ago, I was editor of a series of papers and very famous mathematician. He wrote THM. So I gave the word processor a command. Wherever you see THM, you change it to theorem. Then I forgot about it. Six months later, it was time to read the proofs of the papers. And I was surprised to see a word called Algori theorem. So first I thought my friend has coined a very clever word because there is something which could be an algorithm as well as a theorem. And then I realized something was wrong. So you have to be careful. So that part is true. The next one is a bit of a joke. We have become more and more conscious of language now. So earlier, if you want to describe humanity, you will just say man. So for example, in Delhi, there used to be a museum in the Fiki building, which was made around 1970, and it was called the Museum of Man. It looks strange. Then it became Museum of Mankind. It still looks strange, because you have to give equal emphasis to women. So this is now a joke, not a true story. The first one was, I was editing some book, and I said, wherever you see man, you put woman. Let's be fair to the other side. Another editor helping me, he had the solution that wherever you see man, make man and woman. Now both these programs started working together. And then first they made woman and woo woman. Then they made, it's like a theorem going to algorithm. So this program was infinitely iterating itself and making woo, 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 woman, and so on. And no matter how far you go, there'll still be distinction till you go to infinity, whatever that means. Second is a mathematician's joke. There was a professor teaching, let's say, linear algebra. He made an exam and didn't count the number, numbers he gave as marks properly. So it was supposed to be a 100 marks exam. So it was a 100 marks exam. And the marks he had actually written totaled only to 99. So like you, the students are very possessive, very competitive about marks. So they came and complained, sir, you have undercounted. So his solution was, he looked at 100 over 99. That's 1.0101010 dot, dot, dot. So he said, multiply everybody's marks by that number. So the person who had 52 now got 52.525252 dot, 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 et cetera. One student, perfect student, had 99 out of 99. So her marks were made 99.999999. So this poor student now goes home. Parents are even more competitive than students. So his, her father says, hey, you didn't get 100. And the student out of exasperation says, that's the limit. <laughs> so limit here, you have to understand in different senses. And part of the talk will try to make it precise. What's the meaning of 99.99999 being actually equal to 100? So to understand what is infinity, first we understand what are numbers, what is counting. So we have the sequence of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4. So one may try to imagine how these numbers might have entered human culture, human history. So in the beginning, you had people living in communities, maybe raising cattle. And every day, your cattle go out. And you want to be sure that all the cattle have come in. So you may set up some system. 
you have maybe pebbles, cowries in India. So you keep a certain number of cowries. Everybody knows a cowrie, right? Okay. So when a cow goes out, you keep a pebble or cowrie, whatever you have here on the table. So certain number of cattle have gone out. You have the corresponding number of cowries. In the evening when they're coming back home, you go on removing the cowries one by one. If nothing is left, all your cattle have come back. If some cowries are left, you have lost some cattle. If all the cowries have been accounted for and more cattle are still coming in, then you have got some extra cattle. So like this, you establish what is called a one-to-one -one correspondence between two different classes of objects. So here in this room, for example, I suspect there are more students, more people than chairs. So what do I do? I look at the chairs. If all the chairs are occupied and some people are standing, then I know there are more people than chairs. On the other hand, if everybody was sitting and some chairs were empty, then I would know there are more chairs than people. So that's the idea of having two sets and setting up one-to-one -one correspondence between them. And then now each time you don't want to carry cowries in your pocket or you don't want to carry chairs to count the number of students. So you make a mental universe, one, two, three, four, and you are ticking against that set. So that's how you may think of numbers. What I want to emphasize is there are two different sets. And if you have one-to-one -one correspondence between them, that's easy to understand. Then you say that the two sets have the same number of elements. So underlying fundamental notion is of set, which are collections of objects. And if you can establish a one-to-one -one correspondence, that's important idea. Then you say they have the same number of elements. So number is not an object. Four is not something hanging around here. Four is something which is common between some sets, and we call it four. So that's important to understand infinity, which we'll reach later. Now, of course, when you start learning numbers, every child wants to impress his friend. I know some number bigger than what you know. So you can count up to 10, I can count up to 20. So one of the early books which we read was by Gamow called One, Two, Three, Infinity. So in the first or second page, he talks of a culture where they can count only up to three. After three, it's, they just say many. On the other hand, when we were children, when our parents told us, you know, it was in Hindi, so karod ke baad, arab, arab, kharab, shank, neel, padam. So you, every child learned more and more to impress his friend. But large numbers occur in many stories also. So a story which everybody may have heard is the chessboard story. The game of chess was invented perhaps in India, and the king was very happy with the inventor of the game. He asked him to ask for any reward. And this person said, give me one grain of rice to be put in the first square, two in the next one, four, multiply every time by two, and I want just that much. So the king thought this person is very foolish. He's asking for so little. But if you do the calculation, what will you get at the end? Two to the power 64, which is a very large number, which may be bigger than the rice production of the world. Gabao gave this story, and I have always been curious about this. You may have seen this game. Has, has everybody seen this? Yeah, this is Tower of Hanoi, Hanoi, and in Gamow's book, Tower of Brahma. So what is the game? You see these disks, which are progressively reducing in size. You have to transfer all of them from this peg to this, with the condition that at no time should a larger disk be on a smaller disk. So how will I begin? I'll put this here. Then I put it here. Now I'm stuck. I can't bring it either here or here. So I bring it here without violating the condition, and then I can bring it here. Then again, I'm caught with the same question. So you have to play it intelligently so that the conditions are met. 
Now again, the same question, how many moves will you need to accomplish what you have been asked to, to do? Any, yes? Of course, it will depend on the number of disks. So here is an exercise which can be easily done by all students. Let try to find a formula if I have, in this, the, my version, I have six uh, disks. How many moves will be needed to shift from one bed to another? In Gamau's book, he says, there is a temple in Banaras where there is this with three gold sticks and 64 diamond, or maybe the other way around, three diamond sticks and 64 gold discs. And the pundits sitting there are doing it all the time. And when the game is finished, the universe will come to an end. Uh, now, it seems far-fetched, but it's not. Once you have done the exercise I've given you, you will see that I don't want to tell you the number. The number you will calculate, yes? Sure, sure, sure. But here it's better to hear what I'm saying. You can do this later. <laughs> so the, if you do the calculation, you will find the time needed is almost like the age of the universe as we are being told by astronomers these days. So you can generate very large numbers by easy thought experiments. Now the question comes, can I tell you what's the largest number? So as I say, children are fascinated by this. So somehow we have this notion of order. So my son, when he was small, would ask me, what comes after Kanyakumari? So in his imagination, Kanyakumari is the last point of something. Then at some point he understood, then you might come Australia. After Australia comes space for him. So, so like that, you may ask, what's a number bigger than what my friend tells me? And if you have learned the decimal notation, Immediately, somebody gives you a number 439267834444 dot dot. All you have to do is to add one or add one zero. You get a larger number. But somebody may ask, how about all the numbers put together? Now, there is nothing strange about that question. When you learn geometry, you learn something about all triangles. Two triangles are congruent if and only if something happens. So you are somehow thinking that all triangles can be drawn. So in that sense, triangle looks a little more physical kind of object because you can draw it. 27, you can't draw or you can't see. But the question is of the same kind. A geometry statement is true for all triangles, all squares, all points. So I may ask, what about the set of all numbers? Now, of course, that never ends. So you may say it's endless. It's not finite. So I think you need to lower the volume. Lower the volume, or maybe I have, I don't have a phone in my pocket, usually. The, yeah. I thought my voice was strong enough to carry in this room. No, I think the recording is still So you may think all the chairs in this room, all the grains of rice in a bag, all the rice production of the entire world, it may be large numbers, but nevertheless, they are finite. 40 digit number, more than that, but it's some finite number. If you want to talk of all the numbers, you realize that it never ends, and therefore you introduce a word like infinite. At this stage, it's a loose word like bottomless sea, endless sky, and so on. Now, how to make it workable for you in various mathematics problems? So one of the earliest theorems in mathematics is that prime numbers are infinite. Why is this a little surprising? Because you may think prime numbers are sort of rare compared to 1, 2, 3, 4. As you become larger and larger, the chance of becoming a prime is smaller. 
because larger a number, it's more likely that it will find some factor. So Euclid proved, this is volume 9 of Euclid, proposition 20, and the way it's phrased is a little strange. Prime numbers are more than any assigned multitude of prime numbers. So they are hesitant to grapple with what is meant by infinite. So they put it in a little roundabout way. The proof is very remarkable, very beautiful, and I'll have something to say about those words. If you have seen the proof, then you know it. If not, here it is. Take any prime numbers, P1, P2, Pk, any. Multiply them and add 1. So I take P1 times P2 times P dot, 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 Pk and add 1. I've got some number. Is it a prime or is it not? If it is a prime, I have found one more prime. If it is not, it should be divisible by some prime number. That divisor cannot be P1, P2, or Pk, because each of them leaves a remainder 1. So in either case, we have got a new prime number. And P1, P2, Pk were just arbitrary, any primes. So no matter what list of primes you choose, there would be something beyond that. So that means the, number, the prime numbers are not finite. So that's a very beautiful proof. Of course, what means beautiful? So I've written attributes of beauty in mathematics. Depth, it should tell us some, some truth which you couldn't have easily imagined. There should be some surprise. The method should be powerful, generality, economy, elegance. These are qualities which we look for and you are young, you may try to look for the same qualities in a piece of poetry or literature. They are different things. If we have time, we can discuss. Everybody has heard of Galileo. So Galileo made a remarkable discovery. So look at this circle and look at a smaller circle sitting here. Intuitively, if you ask anybody this question, which has more points? You will see obviously the bigger circle has more points. But Galileo found a remarkable argument to say, no, even though one circle is bigger than the other, they have exactly the same points, same number of points. And remember what is number? We agreed if two sets are in one-to-one -one correspondence, then they have the same number of elements. So here is the proof. Put two, the two circles like this, take a common center, draw this line. Every point here, P, goes to a unique point P prime on the other circle. Do the opposite, take a point Q prime on the outer circle, draw the line connecting it to the center. It cuts the smaller circle in exactly one point. So these two circles are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Something similar about line segments, So I may give you this line segment here and here, and I'm claiming that they have exactly the same number of points. That means they are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So make a triangle like this and do the same thing. If I take any point Q here, join this line, extend it, you get a unique point on the second line and vice versa. An easier way of saying this, which you can tell your friend who may have no interest in mathematics, as you walk on a street in the night, you, see you have lamps and your body starts casting a shadow. As you're walking away from the light, the shadow becomes bigger and bigger. As you approach the next lamp, it vanishes, then it starts again. But each point on the shadow is the image of some point on your body. So though the size of the shadow is becoming bigger or smaller, each point represents some point on your body. So that's a way of looking at this in another way. So this is Galileo telling us something counterintuitive that any line segment, any two line segments have the same number of points. They are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Then Galileo noticed that there are just as many numbers which are squares of numbers as there are numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 
and one square, two square, three square, four square are in one to one correspondence. So though you will have one, four, nine, what's the next one, 16, 25, becoming rarer and rarer, but you can put them in one to one correspondence with the set of whole numbers. In the same way, there are as many even numbers as their whole numbers, though you are taking, you are ignoring all the odd numbers. So you will think what you are left with is one half, but it's not so. If you have any questions, comments, please feel free. Now this again conflicts with what people had been thinking till then. So Euclid, as you know, lays down axioms. And one of them is a common notion number five. The whole is greater than the part. Seems obvious, seems something fine. But yes. <laughs> OK. So this is how Galileo puts it. We can only infer that the totality of all numbers, etc. You can read it there. I need not read it for you. Now, by the way, I can recommend some great books uh, outside mathematics. You, everybody has heard about the God particle. Yes, God particle, you heard of that? So that's the title of a book by a great physicist called Leon Lederman. He wanted to name it the God damned particle actually. And the editor stopped that. So it's become famous as the God particle. So one of the things he describes is how Galileo was among the greatest scientists of all time, both as an experimenter and as a theoretician. Experiments we all know. But this was a revelation to me that the uh, mechanics, he discovered many laws by looking at balls sliding down inclined planes. In those days, there were no stopwatches, so how to measure time? So apparently, if you are well trained in music and you hear a beat, if it's off by 1 16th, your ear can register the difference. So Galileo had a good musically trained ear, but he didn't have a stopwatch. Stopwatches didn't exist at that time. So he measured time by resorting to this device of setting up experiments where balls will roll down planes and will each time you cross a wire, there will be a sound. From that sound, he could infer at what speed they are going. As a theoretician, Lederman gives this example. So one of the laws of mechanics, which again seems counterintuitive, if something is at rest, it remains at rest. And if it's moving with uniform velocity, it continues to do so. That's somewhat counterintuitive. That's not what you observe. Galileo's reasoning for this was, again, a limit if you slide down a ball down, you have time for exercises in this workshop. Tell me if I give you the number m comma n, where does it figure in this counting? You understand the question or shall I repeat it? In this counting, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and so on. So I'm asking you, if I was to ask you where does two, four fit in into this counting, you should be able to tell me. Any number in that array is m comma n. So find out in this counting where it occurs. You have to figure out exactly the formula, OK? So that's a good exercise. Anybody can do it here. It's within your means. So what is the upshot of this? If I have countably many infinite sets, each having countably many elements, the total number put together is still countably infinite. You don't get a larger infinity by doing that. Two, three, four, it seemed reasonable, but it seems even if you put infinitely many infinite sets together, in countably infinite, you don't get anything bigger. That's a surprise. This is Cantor's argument. This shows rational numbers. What's a rational number? It's something of the form m over n, where m and n are integers. So it's the same argument. 
सो यू मे थिंक नाउ दैट देर इज ओनली वन काइंड ऑफ इन्फिनिटी अब वी फाउंड समथिंग इन्फिनिट आई पुट ट्वाइस एज मेनी थिंग्स आई स्टिल गेट द सेम थिंग नॉट एनी थिंग बिगर आई पुट हंड्रेड टाइम्स द सेम सेट आई डोंट गेट एनी थिंग बिगर आई पुट इन्फिनिटली मेनी ऑफ दो सेट्स टूगेदर आई स्टिल डोंट गेट एनी थिंग बिगर so you may think there is one infinity end of the world has been reached but that's not the case so it turns out if i take the set consisting of all points on a line or a line segment it's uncountable it it has more elements so what am i saying i am saying you take the num you take points on a line which we have seen earlier are the same no matter what the size of the line segment is so take the interval 0 1 i am claiming that <coughs> the infinity here is larger than the infinity of natural numbers So I have two proofs here. Something is bothering my throat, so I'll give you only one of them. Just a minute, which is more interesting, also because that's not the one usually found in a book. So suppose the elements of the set zero to one, the interval zero one, were countable. What does that mean? that means i can count them what does that mean i can label them as x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 going on and on i am claiming they would still not cover the interval 0 to 1 and here is my proof take your first point x1 put it in an interval of size 0.1 so this interval is size 0.1 take the next point x2 put it inside an interval of size 0.01 so how much of length you have covered together x1 was put in an interval of length 0.1 x2 has been put in the inter in an interval of length 0.01 so together i have covered length 0.11 at most because these intervals could have also intersected i don't know so in any case less than 0.11 now take the third point x3 put it in an interval of length 0.001 how much have i covered 0.111 go on doing this so after exhausting everything i am still less than 0.111111 whereas the interval of length 1 as length 1 so if the points of interval 0 1 were countable then i can put everything together in something of length less than 0.11111 which is of course not the same thing as 1 so the infinity of real numbers or the infinity which measures 0 1 is strictly bigger than the infinity of natural numbers <laughs> now when you will study what's called lebesgue measure you will study something further i took point 1 and then point 01 i could have also taken point 00001 to begin with and so the total length will be smaller than anything i can think about so a countable set cannot cover any length so coming back to infinity so let me sum up what i have said so far natural numbers have the infinity or the cardinality alpha not rational numbers which is a much bigger set also has cardinality alpha not that could have made us suspect maybe there is only one kind of infinity but if you take the number of points on the line segment 0 1 you have got a strictly bigger infinity so traditionally this is 
denoted by the symbol C. So I have shown you Aleph naught is strictly smaller than C. So the mathematician who made all this theory, his name was Cantor. So you may ask a question, is there anything in between these two infinities? So I have one infinity, Aleph naught, and other infinity C, and one is strictly bigger than the other. So natural question which arises, is there something in between? Cantor said there can't be anything in between, and that was called the continuum hypothesis. And this led to some new kind of mathematics. At the end of the day, it turned out you can neither prove this statement nor disprove it. And that's in a more precise sense. If there's a question, I can answer that. But let's proceed right now. So now you may think that I've made a larger infinity. Just as we played a game as kids, you tell me 5, I tell you 7, this guy says 11, 37, and so on. Can I go on manufacturing bigger and bigger infinities? So that's the question we'll ask. So three questions. Is there a still bigger infinity? Is there then a largest infinity? And what we found first, Aleph naught, is that the smallest infinity. The third question is easy to answer. Aleph naught is the smallest. Let me not worry about that. So question number one and two. Can I go on making larger and larger infinite sets? And the answer is yes. Is everybody with me? Shall I try a proof or it's too much? Raise your hands if you want a proof. OK. So, so not a minority. This is a very important argument. Now, to get you going on this, there is something called Barber's paradox. So this is all coming from the same set of things, self-application of a rule. So suppose you have an army unit, and a barber is there who is ordered now that you will shave those people and only those people who don't shave themselves. So let me repeat. A barber is told he is to shave those people and only those people who don't shave themselves. The question is now, what does the barber do to himself? Does he shave himself or not? Either case, you, lead into, uh, you reach a contradiction. You are not supposed to shave yourself because you are saving only those people who don't shave themselves. On the other hand, so either way, you run into difficulty. So this is what is called Russell's paradox in logic. So that, in some form, will occur here. Yes? Yeah? So don't worry. Say whatever you have to say. Barber must be? Barber. Bar <laughs> <laughs> the barber could be a woman, right? So traditionally, you say such a barber doesn't exist. But yes, a barber is somebody who is ordered to shave those and only those who don't shave themselves. Now you start thinking, what does the barber do for himself? Does he shave himself or not? <laughs> All right, you can think a little more about that. Uh, by the way, again, I recommend books where the logician by the name Raymond Smullyan, who has written a wonderful series of books. The first one was called, What is the Name of This Book? And you can see there's a, there's a paradox there. And if that's the title of the book, there's a problem. He wrote another book called Alice in Puzzle Land. Many of you would have read Alice in Wonderland. Uh, so where here the characters ask each other questions. So in the same way, on an island, there are two kinds of people whom he calls knights and knaves. The puzzle proceeds like this. One set of people, knights, always tell the truth. The other set of people, knaves, always tell a lie. Always is important. So you meet somebody on the street, and you have to figure out whether he's this or that. What question should you? And you are allowed one question. Then you can make it more complicated. There are three people you meet, 
and you are allowed, let's say, two questions or whatever the number, and you have to figure out whether what they are telling you is correct or wrong. So you can make more and more complicated things of this kind. And then he has written eight or ten books in the same way. Okay, so let's come back to here. So where were we? I am saying give me any infinity and I'll make a bigger infinity. So that's the point. So for this I need the idea of what is called the power set. So take any, oops, take any set X and look at the collection of all subsets of X. So simplest example, X is the set 1, 2, 3. What are all subsets of X? The empty set, three sets containing just one element, three sets containing two elements, and the whole set. So if you count this number, you will have eight. So if X has N elements, then its power set, that's this collection of all subsets of X, has two to the power N elements. Binomial theorem, actually, if you like, you can use that. Uh, how about infinite sets? So if I have any infinite set, and I make the collection of all subsets of that infinite set, I'll get a larger infinity. That's what the claim is. So let's prove this. Proof is easy if you understand the Barber's paradox. So I repeat, x is any set, and this px is the class of all subsets of x. And I'm claiming this has strictly more elements than x. It has at least as many because take any point x here and take it to the set containing the point x. So that's an element here. So there is a one-to-one -one map from x into px. That's no problem. I'm claiming such a map cannot be onto. That is, there will be some element of px which is not covered by any such function. So suppose, if possible, there is a bijection. Bijection means a one-to-one onto map. So any point x here is taken to an image P of x, which is a subset of x. Now comes the question, so I have x here, I have P of x here. Does this element x belong to Px? Always, sometimes, never, that's what we have to decide. So look at, Look at all those x which are not elements of px. See, keep in mind Russell's paradox is something like this. Is there a set consisting of all sets? And either way you run into trouble. So this p of x is a subset of x, hence it's equal to pu for some u. Because I've assumed this map is onto. Again ask the question, does u belong to this pu? Suppose it does then it contradicts this definition because it's the collection of all things which don't belong to px. If it does not, it must belong to you. So sorry, this has been done in a bit of a hurry. But let me repeat what I have said. The collection of all subsets of a given set, finite or infinite, always has strictly more elements than the original set. So that's the point. So if I've reached any infinity, I can make a larger infinity by just making the set of all subsets of that set. So this goes on and on and on. So there is an infinite number of infinities also. So there's no end to constructing infinite sets. It goes on and on and on. So here is a quote from Shakespeare, which may appeal to younger people more than to older people. This is what Juliet says to Romeo. Uh, and of course, in every language, you will find equivalent, equivalent things. Iqbal, sitaron se aage jahan aur bhi. So you can go on. Abhi ishq ke imtihaan aur bhi. So that's, uh, yeah. But now in our culture, I think Romeo has become a derogatory kind of word. <laughs> I hope it doesn't remain so. So thank you.
Hello, sir. I'm Manath. A set of integers or natural numbers is countable as it can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence. Is the same possible for the infinite set and what can we say about it? Is it countable or uncountable? So let me repeat. Any set which can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers is called a countable set. So that's the definition of countable. OK? Question, what are such sets? Other than the natural numbers, of course. And we saw examples. Subsets of x, subsets of all natural numbers. So I think the point which should be emphasized again and again, if you have a finite set, remove one element, you get a strictly smaller set. Right? One definition of an infinite set is precisely that that doesn't happen. If you remove one element, two elements, one billion elements, you do not get a smaller set. In the sense, these sets are still in one-to-one -one correspondence. And we saw examples. Take just prime numbers, take even numbers, take odd numbers, take whole square, squares. They are proper subsets of the big set, but still they are in one-to-one -one correspondence. That's the very definition of an infinite set. Now I start going in the other direction. I take two of these sets, put them together. I still don't get a bigger set. They are still in one-to-one -one correspondence. If I take 27 such sets, I still don't get a bigger set. If I take 3 million such sets, so that is the same thing. But the first time, there's a big surprise. If I have a countable number of countable sets and put them all together, I still don't get a bigger set. That's what I showed, that rational, diagonal. These are, by the way, very simple. I had to rush through some of the things. You can easily sit down in the next two days and make these arguments a little formal. So that may raise the question, is that the end? I never get a bigger set. But that's not the end. I displayed an infinity, like number of points in the interval 0, 1, which is infinite, but it's not countable. And the argument is not too difficult either. So I hope that answers uh, what you asked. Yeah. Yes, sir. And a second question. I've often heard people say limits at infinity. What is the meaning of limits at infinity? You asked a good question because that's where we actually use infinity. All this is very fine. So let me ask you a question. I'm looking at a sum 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus dot dot dot. 1 plus 1 half plus 1 3 plus 1 over 4, plus dot, dot, dot. I will write a few at random, and not quite at random, but we'll discuss this. So 1 plus 1 over 2 square. Just written a few things, sums, but I don't end the summation. I keep on doing it. Of course, I'll die before that happens. But imagine the mental universe where you are going to add on and on and on. So what do you think happens to this one? Hmm? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry? It keeps getting added. One keeps getting added. There's no one end. One keeps on it. getting added, and the sum keeps on becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. How big? We don't know that. Like, till the time it keeps going on, one yeah, keeps getting added. Yeah, so now added. we want to make it precise so that we do. OK, so before that, let me ask you a question. If I write numbers 
in anything 2, 3, 7, minus 6, 4, 0, 8, 1, minus 7. And I want to add all of these. So if I add like this, first these, then these three, then these three, or if I add like this, will I get the same answer? So I have 1 minus 1, then zeros. Then I shift this, make 0, 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 1 minus 1, and so on. And it continues. If I add according to the rows, what's the answer you get? I add the first row, what's the answer? 0. 0. Then I add the second row, what's the answer? 0. And so on. So total will again be 0. Now let me add column wise. What's the answer I get? 1. First column is 1. Then this is 0. This is 0. zero. And that's minus 1. So something is not quite right here, right? If I add according to rows, I'm getting the answer 0. If I add according to columns, then I get the answer 1. So you have to be careful. That's what mathematics is about. I have infinite processes, infinitesimal processes. I want to calculate the area of a circle and so on. And if I handle infinite sets, if I'm not careful, I'll get nonsensical answers. So we have to develop confidence that what we are doing is right. For that, you have to understand limits, limiting processes, and so on. So as you said, here at the nth step, I have got n. So if I add a billion terms, I've got billion. But I add a few more, I'll get larger numbers. So it goes on and on. It doesn't stop anywhere. So I introduce a language that this sum is diverging to infinity. What does that mean? It only means that give me any number. By adding more terms, I will cross that number. So that's the meaning of going to infinity. infinity itself is not a number. It's not the same kind of thing as 47. But to say something goes to infinity means uh, you have a sum like this. You can go on adding to cross any limit which you like. So the limit of this is infinity. So this sum is infinite. Uh, before coming to this, let me ask you what's, what's the sum here. You see number three here. Yes, sir. So can you guess what this will lead to? Anybody with a guess? Uh, I should have been slightly careful. Just allow me to change this. Because that's easier, but the idea is the same. 1 plus 1 half plus 1 over 2 square plus 1 over 2 cube and so on. So this sum should sum up to 2. To 2? Yeah. Tell me why. Uh, because we begin with 1. Yes. Then uh, let's say we construct maybe a rectangle that's made of two squares. And each square is 1. So one, the first one is the first square. We divide this. So here's the right answer. So let yeah. me explain in a little different model. I have a bucket or a cylinder, whatever you like. At the first step, I fill half of it. At the next step, I fill in one fourth. That means I cover one half of what was left. At the next step, I'm filling one eighth. So I'm covering half of what was left. And I keep on doing this. So again, there are two ways of looking at it. First one was the Greek way, Zeno's paradox. You will never fill the bucket because at each stage something is left. Or you can look at it in another way. If I give you this, this is one. Give me anything slightly less than one. After some number of steps, I'll cross that. So just as there I went to infinity, here I'm reaching one. By taking enough number of terms, I can come as close to 1 as I wish. So this, uh, this is 2. This sum is equal to 2. Because 1 was already there, and this whole thing adds up to 1. How about this one? So 1 plus 1 plus 1 was easy. The other one was easy. But what about 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus? 
What happens to that? Hmm? Uh, not really. So here it's not that obvious. This argument doesn't work. So this was the terms were becoming smaller and smaller at sufficiently high rate. Here they are becoming smaller and smaller, but it's not clear. There's no simple argument which will decide this. So you have to think a little more. Yes. Yes, you are right, but how do you deduce that? How do you know that? Because here by adding more and more, we didn't cross one. So how do you know that doesn't happen there? Yeah. Okay, here is a hint. Yeah. If I take, let's say, the first few things here, can I make it bigger than one half by taking enough things here? Yeah. Then I may have to take a few more and still make it cross one half. Yeah. So do that. It's, All right. it's, it's not obvious. You have to work a little bit. So what I'm saying is this sum also goes to infinity. How about this one? So what is this? I find it easier to use this notation, otherwise I make mistakes. I take, the terms are 1 over n squared. So 1 plus 1, 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared and so on. So what do you imagine can be the answer? Okay, first let's decide whether it's finite or not. And I tell you the answer is already there on the board, but you have to use it cleverly. Uh, this, I think, is finite. You have to give reasoning, you see. Not, okay. No. Um, I think it's finite because we had uh, 2 over there, and then we see that this sum should be lesser than... Uh, Good. Yeah. So this is smaller than this. This was yeah. 1 half. This is 1 over 2 squared. Yeah. This was 1 over 2 squared. This is 1 over 3 squared. Yeah. So this sum has to be smaller than this. this yeah. That we know is finite. Yeah. And this is something smaller, so it has to be finite. Yeah. Now remarkably, one of the most beautiful formulas in mathematics. You can calculate the exact value. Here it was 2. This is pi square over 6. That's one of the great theorems proved by oil. Now how I should pi enter here? And since I'm doing this, Is this the one? Can anybody help me? Which is the Madhva Neil Kanta series? Just, just, just one minute. So, uh, odd numbers. So one. Okay. This is log two. So, so one minus one over three plus one over five minus one over seven. This answer turns out to be pi over four. And this was done by Indian mathematicians long ago, Kerala School of Mathematics. Uh, the answer is pi over 4. So as I said, there are elements of beauty, elegance, surprise, all are here. Pi, what is pi? We learn of pi as the ratio of the uh, circumference of the circle to the diameter. What has it got to do with 1, 2, 3, 4? On the surface, nothing. But this answer turns out to be pi over 4. So it's a surprise. You need powerful methods to do that. So for this, you have to come to a real analysis course or a Fourier series course where you will learn this. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, um, the first thing is that, as you said, that there is always a larger set of numbers. So can we say that a set of numbers can be infinitely small, but also infinitely large? I didn't say there is a larger set of numbers. So let's get it right once again. Okay. Look at the collection of all natural numbers. Okay. Now you may have difficulty imagining that, but you are already doing it when you do geometry. Two triangles have such and such property. So that means all triangles have that property, right? So two triangles are congruent if and only if something happens. Uh, you haven't actually drawn the triangle. You are proving a theorem which is valid for all triangles, right? The sum of all angles in a triangle is what? Pi? <laughs> pi, right? 180 degrees, as you will say. That's a statement true for all triangles, no matter what. So similarly, I want to have theorems which are true for all numbers, no matter what. So I'm forced to think of the set of all numbers. So that's not the smallest set in any sense, the set of all numbers. Now I'm trying to understand how many elements does it have? How many in inverted commas? Anything which can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with this is said to have the cardinality, which we called all of naught. Surprises start like this, that you can have a proper subset of natural numbers which has the same cardinality. Or you can put two copies, three copies, 20 copies, countable number of copies. You don't, you don't go to a higher level of infinity. So that was the crux of this. Not the smallest. Smallest is natural numbers. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I actually have a few more questions, but can you share an email ID like for that? Sure. Okay, thank you. I'm here, uh, available a little later also, if you want to talk to me. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. This is Panya Chaudhary from Mumbai. Sir, is there any way you can explain how 1.9 bar is 2? The explanation was here. So what she is asking is one point. What does it mean? What does it mean to say two numbers are not equal, first of all? Tell me. If two numbers are not equal, one has to be smaller than the other, right? So I have two numbers A and B. So there are three possibilities. Either A is equal to B, or A is less than B, or B is less than A. A is this and B is this. So which are we ruling out? No, no, no. That's what you want to prove now. So let's be clear. Your question is, how do I prove A is equal to B? I'm saying with two numbers, there are three possibilities. Either A is equal to B, or one is smaller than the other. This clearly is ruled out. This is my A, and this is my B. Obviously, it's not bigger than so I have to worry whether A is strictly smaller than B. If that is also ruled out, then A has to be equal to B. How do you rule this out? So that is what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Now I want you to think with me. What did we do in that series, which, which is now gone from the board? I had a bucket which I was trying to fill. So here is. B, and I want to say this one cannot be strictly smaller than B. If it was smaller, it will lie somewhere here. Take enough number of nines, you can cross this. So I cross this. Take enough further number of nines, I would cross this. So if there is a number A smaller than B, then there has to be some gap between them, right? 
and no matter what gap you take, you can always go above that. So that's the meaning of saying 1.9999 is equal to 2. If they were not equal, then there will be some gap. But that gap can be crossed by taking more and more. And so that's the idea of limit. Yeah. So usually in schools, I have been asked a different kind of question. Somebody or the other has heard of Ramanujan sums. Right. <laughs> Does anybody here know that? So people ask normally this question, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, what is it, minus 1 over 12, Shanta, is that? Minus 1 over 12. So usually this question is asked. So have you seen this Ramanujan sums and other things? Obviously that looks strange, if not nonsensical, right? So we can discuss that later. <laughs> so the point is that mathematicians go to more and more subtle questions. So we said prime numbers, even numbers, squares, all have cardinality, all of not. But that's not the end of the story. See, obviously, squares like 1, 2 square, 3 square, 4 square, 5 square are infinite. Cubes also are infinite. One, 3 cube, 2 cube, 3 cube, 4 cube. But do you feel that's the end of the matter or something more should be said or can be said? Or let me make a simpler question. Even numbers, multiples of 2, they are infinite and they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with all numbers. So are multiples of 3. So are multiples of 4. But is that the end of the matter or something more should be, should be thought about? Is my question clear? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, dot, dot, dot. And I have two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, dot, dot, dot. Each of them is in one-to-one -one correspondence. Sorry, I want to do it to the next one. They are all sets with the same cardinality. But is that the end of the story or something else is also there, which is a more involved phenomenon, which is almost obvious, but we should carry it out further. What do you think? Here I am looking at every alternate number. Here I am looking at every third number. So there has to be some difference. How to capture that? By the way, in a lighter vein, since Vijay is here, there is a joke mathematicians make about other disciplines. A proof that every number is a prime number. So physicist looks at numbers and says one is a prime number. For this story, it's convenient to have one as a prime number. So one is a prime number, two is a prime number, three is a prime number, four is not a prime number, five is a prime number, Four was experimental error, and therefore every number is prime number. <laughs> Chemist looks at the numbers and says one is a prime number, two is a prime number, three is a prime number, and says therefore every number is a prime number. So he stopped at three physicists, went up to five. No, I don't know whether to say biologist or, engin <laughs> or engineer, maybe an Ashoka economist would be safer. 
So he looks at numbers and says, one is a prime number, two is a prime number, three is a prime number, four is a prime number, five is a prime number, six is a prime number. So every number is a prime number. Yeah, but let's come back here. And I have also the sequence of squares. So one, two square, three square, four square, five square, etc. So all these sets are in one-to-one -one correspondence. The odd numbers do not have one-to-one -one correspondence with the, any of the numbers in the second row. These are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Over there, yeah. And two sets in one-to-one -one correspondence with the third set. Third set. Also will be. Also, one, okay. one, yeah. So here I am picking every second number, and here I am picking every third number. So there is a difference. So I have to introduce a concept of density of a set, which will capture that. Now here it's trivial. This is every one. So I'll take. So suppose. Fn is the nth element of this set. I can look at Fn over n and take limit n going to infinity. So tell me what is it for this set? If I take n elements, roughly speaking, one half of them are multiples of two, the other half are not, right? Odd or even are just half. So this will be one, one half. Here it will be 1 over 3. What will it be here? Fn over n. So look at all even numbers smaller than n. So there are half of them. Here it will be 1 third. So again, these are exercises which you can easily do. You may have to spend 20 minutes or so. For this, it will be 0. And let me give the last one for prime numbers. It is, does anybody know the prime number theorem? n upon f. Okay. No, the way I am thinking is I am looking at all even numbers. OK, OK, you are counting, yeah. OK, sorry. So the point I'm making is look at the density, the frequency with which, so that's the whole beginning of a whole subject or chain of ideas. So how many prime numbers roughly are there smaller than n? Yeah, so these are great theorems of mathematics. So though prime numbers are infinitely many, squares are also infinitely many, there is still a difference between them that roughly with what proportion they occur in the whole big set. There are ways of formalizing that. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Um, so, so, here, okay. So, a bus with an infinite number of passengers, infinite number of buses with infinite number of passengers. Easier. Yes. Infinite number of buses with infinite number of seats they turn up to the hotel. So that's it, and we solve that with diagonalization like this, uh, like a snake, and that's a two-dimensional case. And for the three-dimensional case, we move like a pyramid. And these are all visual proofs. Uh, but how, is, there, is there a formalization that generalizes is it, that generalizes it to cases for dimension greater than or equal to four? Yeah, no problem. Only you have to develop a little bit of thinking along these lines. So here is a square. And here is the line segment 0 to 1. And I want to say that they are at the same cardinality. Number of points in the square is the same as the number of points in 0, 1. You know the proof? Any proof? Yeah, but how do you know a countable number of, uncountable number of those put together? So I have to, I can explicitly give a map. So obviously you have to prove there is a one-to-one -one map from here to here. So take x, 
comma y. X has a decimal expansion. So call that point x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. Y is some point y1, y2, y3, dot, dot, dot. Now out of these I make, let's say z, which is point x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, dot, dot, dot. So given two elements here, I can make a number, so this is decimal expansion. So I can get a point here, and you have to see this uniquely determined and so on. So now you can do it with three also. You said, can I do it with higher dimensions, right? So take a cube, the same thing. So there'll be three, three coordinates for each, right? So there's room to play with infinity. That's the point. 